Hello everyone, so welcome to lesson 2 of your facilitating learner-centered teaching. And uh, just a brief recall, during the past video lecture or the previous video lecture, we had um, learner-centered teaching, its uh, principles and characteristics. So now we're moving on to a paradigm shift from teacher-centered to learner-centered teaching. So. If in the past lecture you have uh, had a picture okay of how different uh, the teacher manned classroom is over a learner uh, participated classroom then uh, that already is a good idea that you can carry along as we move to this particular lesson all right so here you are expected at the end of the lesson to differentiate learner-centered with teacher-centered teaching. Definitely, you will also have to discuss the need to shift from a teacher-centered teaching to a learner-centered teaching based on philosophical foundations, teaching pr principles, and current research, and identify learning scenarios reflective of the underscored philosophies. As we go through the lecture discussion, and uh, definitely when you shall be sharing your reflections, particularly your learning and your insights from the topic, then uh, we would be able to materialize all these learning objectives. Okay, so here are two basic approaches to teaching. First is, of course, a teacher-centered approach. So these or these approaches geared towards teacher as the center of instruction are more traditional in nature. I have already mentioned that previously. And usually these focus on the teacher as instructor. So it's kind of a repetition. It's just a reminder that uh, this by nature is teacher-centered approach. The focus is the instructor or the teacher. Uh, they are sometimes referred to as direct instruction, deductive teaching, or expository teaching, and are typified by the lecture type presentation. So it's kind of uh, a learning environment where teachers will just have to tell about things, okay, from general to specific, okay. They don't necessarily start from basic things and then uh, magnify on that until it gives a bigger idea. Instead, what they do is they can just uh, man the classroom or even start a day in the classroom by telling concepts without um, having to know if the students have background knowledge about it or if the students have prior knowledge about it okay things like that so in these methods of teaching the teacher controls okay the control is on the teacher what does he or she has to control okay these are it what are to be taught and how students are presented with the information that they are to learn okay so if the teacher therefore feels um comfortable comfortable yeah or if she feels that uh during the day, she can go and finish the session with just a pure lecture, then she can do it. She can live by it because she is under the paradigm teacher-centered approach. And um, she also determines exactly how the classroom scenario would go. Okay, so she can just let you sit down all throughout the day and just be receptive of whatever he or she has to teach you. And she, she won't even bother um, asking or grouping the class whether you guys have learned it maximum or others have learned uh, just a bit of the lesson. Or she might not even look into things like what did you not understand from what you understood. Okay, so typically this is how it looks to be in a teacher-centered approach. The teacher is the power, okay, he or she is the control, uh, he or she is uh, the initiator of everything that happens in the classroom. 
okay now we move on to another approach and that concerns student-centered approaches um, in here it's sometimes referred to as discovery learning inductive learning or inquiry le learning okay so these approaches place a much stronger emphasis on the learner's role in the learning process so in here there's already uh, participation or freedom coming from the learners they can actually um, contribute to the flow of uh, a session or a schedule by asking starting it with asking a question or perhaps probing and then uh, later on they can be involved into something that will lead them to discover new things okay and the teacher respects that the teacher welcomes that in a student-centered approach all right so it is more of involving the learners okay and acknowledging that learners have okay uh, a more significant um, contribution to their own learning that is why their roles are well acknowledged okay we move on so here we've got uh, the philosophical perspectives all right for both huh? for both the teacher centered teaching paradigm and then the student or the learner-centered paradigm okay but basically we have to know what uh, philosophy means okay philosophy actually comes from two greek words philo and sophia or sophos okay and uh, philo means love and sophos means wisdom okay so when combined it is actually known as the love of wisdom all right so what does philosophy do okay among teachers why is it important to have uh, these philosophical perspectives uh, as we get to know these two paradigms well not just for teachers but even for learners okay you know um when these philosophies okay are acknowledged or uh, how do you call this embraced by learners and uh, teachers in their teaching and learning process or in their teaching and learning experience then they will get to reflect on so many things particularly uh, key issues and concepts that uh, concern education okay so what are teachers uh, how do you call this what are teachers asked to reflect on if they have philosophical perspectives in mind definitely they will have to to ask themselves right so where is my teaching leading me how does this affect the learners what why am i teaching this how are my learners going to learn about this so these are so many things or so many questions that philosophical perspectives have to do if teachers just acknowledge or if, even if learners just acknowledge that there are actually embedded philosophies or principles that uh, govern their teaching and learning okay so here i'll start off with the philosophies that are under uh, the teacher-centered paradigm okay so it tells there that uh, teacher-centered philosophies are those that transfer knowledge from one generation of teachers to the next okay meaning there is just transference of the same knowledge all right so you also have to consider that uh, in this type of philosophies the teacher's role is to impart respect for authority determination a strong work ethics compassion for others and sensibility so here are the responsibilities of uh, teachers inside uh, these philosophies all right and teachers and schools succeed when students prove typically through taking tests that they have mastered the objectives that they learn so the measure for effectivity of teachers or even of uh, their teaching would be when learners definitely pass exams so we'll get to know in specific details what this generally means all right 
So here they are. The teacher-centered philosophy starts off with essentialism. So I'll not necessarily have to read through what you see on screen now. Uh, this on purpose is for you to have a copy of uh, um, the important details and there's such a philosophy but I'll give you a uh, brief, uh, concise and uh, an easy to understand explanation for each, okay? So essentialism uh, is proposed by one of the most influential advocates of it and that's William Bagley in person, okay? Don't forget that, that he is actually uh, the main advocate of essentialism. All right, so what does a teacher who adhere to essentialism teach? So basically, that kind of a teacher teaches what is basic, okay? So generally, there is this... Uh, uh, these rather essential skills that are embedded under essentialism. And when we say basic, these are just simply like reading, simple math or arithmetic, and then writing. So these are encapsulated in three R's. This, these three are actually called three R's. They don't necessarily start with letter R in each of their spelling, but their, uh, their sound actually starts it like that. So reading, arithmetic, and writing, okay? So remember that uh, the training under this uh, philosophy is to let the mind uh, capture as much as it, as it could. Okay, definitely from where? From lectures, okay? From what the teacher is giving or what the teacher is teaching. Okay, so that is actually the, the very role of essentialism as a philosophy and usually the the technique of teachers under this philosophy would would be purely lecture and then they will let uh, students memorize repeat and then practice and one very important thing that does not uh, uh, how do you call this that you can't separate from essentialism is assessment or test well, because it's basically training of the mind. So these are the activities that you expect. And at the end of the day, test or assessment is the measure of learning, okay? Or even the measure to how effective or how efficient the teacher has been in the classroom. Okay, so that's in simple terms, essentialism as a philosophy, okay? So what then uh, is expected okay among uh, among learners under this well you have to be a hard worker or you have to study smart you have to have a good memory okay and uh, you have to establish that certain level of mental discipline because once that fails then definitely you are out uh, under such an essentialist classroom okay so that's essentialism, and again, that's according to William Bagley. Now we move with perennialism. Okay, perennialism, on the other hand, is proposed by uh, or advocated by Robert Hutchins. Okay, so I think your module does not have a mention of the following names I am going to recall, but you may as well take down notes. Robert is... Uh, spelled as it is, and then Hutchins is spelled H-U-T-C-H-I-N-S, all right? How different is essentialism from perennialism? So the goal of perennialist education is to teach students to think rationally and develop minds that can think critically, all right? So still, we are under um, teacher-centered paradigm, huh? Still, this is a philosophy under it. So a perennialist classroom aims to be closely organized and well-disciplined when it comes to its environment. And that, therefore, has the aim of developing students uh, with a lifelong quest for the truth. So what are being taught okay, under perennialism? When we say perennial, okay, something is believed to be true 
and absolutely accepted in the past and has to be transferred to the next generation. All right, because it is already perennially accepted. Okay, so it's kind of um, whatever uh, we believe our ideas uh, accepted and available during the generation of our old folks are ideas that still last uh, with their absolute truth up to this time. So that is the belief of perennialist teachers. Okay, they believe that uh, history's finest thinkers actually transcend time and never become outdated. So that is uh, their belief. And in here, that's the reason why the classics or the great books are so acknowledged and so looked up to. Okay, so that's perennialism. And uh, what else is in here? Yeah. Still, perennialism is a theory focused on humans and ideas. Ideas that are relevant and meaningful throughout time. So again, it's kind of acknowledging that those ideas in the past, especially by the classic minds or the finest thinkers of history, still last their truth and their um, how do you call this value up to this very time. And they apply it until this time so that is their belief okay now we move on to uh, so there are just two under teacher-centered philosophies now we have under learner-centered philosophies first is progressivism so i'm sure you already had uh, previous knowledge or i mean you have heard already about progressivism and you can never separate this from John Dewey all right as an advocate so it is more developed version of pragmatism emphasizing that ideas should be tested by experimentation all right so that is what they do under progressivism and that learning is rooted in questions developed by learners so look at it the reason why this is first under um, the learner centered philosophies it's because it, um, it welcomes all right, the idea that learners' questions in mind can actually start learning. Okay? So, and then eventually, if they are involved or are into experiments or discovery learnings, then they might as well create more questions or discover more questions that will still uh, multiply learning along the process all right so what is their belief they believe that human experience is far more important than authority when it comes to learning experience is uh, the best teacher as according to progressivism more than the fear that teachers may impose still experience as believed by progressivism would teach learners better and more okay so progressivists believe that change is occurring and should be embraced rather than ignored, okay? And progressivism is all about organized freedom that allows students to take responsibility for their actions in the classroom. You know, because uh, once they are already involved, then they will recognize that they have a share of responsibility when it comes to tasks in the classroom. And next is humanism okay so here the person or the philosopher that uh, you should not forget about is abraham maslow so i'm sure you already know uh, his hierarchy of needs and humanism by the way is concerned with enhancing the innate goodness of the individual you look at that we already have uh, we are assumed to be people with innate goodness in us meaning it's our nature but it just takes a philosophy, which is humanism by its uh, person, to actually enhance that or develop that. Okay, so here the focus is definitely uh, human development or individual development. How can this be uh, enhanced or developed? Of course, by uh, uh, acknowledging that a person 
is free and that uh, he or she has the capacity all right to be self-actualized this is synonymous with existentialism all right and existentialism shares similar nature with humanism because uh, here we we put premium concern on choices the freedom of the individual all right and uh, in a humanistic classroom we welcome that or we care about that and we make sure that the learners are comfortable and they are able to share okay whatever their feelings their beliefs and even their dreams with each other that's the beauty of humanism and now we have all right so the last two would be reconstructionism and constructivism so we'll start with reconstructionism that is um advocated by george count or you can actually consider theodore bramel okay so george counts as you pronounce george is g e o r g e theodore and then bramel just that's just one name okay they are two people you can associate reconstructionism with now what about reconstructionism from the word reconstruct okay so there is a the idea of change all right and re means uh, again okay so here the philosophy centers on the idea of constant change don't forget that uh, learners or even teachers under reconstructionism see the world as ever changing and that if it's that's the, if that's the case then uh, we also need to change in order to adapt to these changes that are occurring so reconstruction is like to focus on reconstructing one area of society how is that possible um, the reason why there are research subjects or there are researches being uh, conducted by many groups of people or by individual people is because there is something that we want to prove disprove and um, to bring about as a new idea and this by nature is reconstructionism okay so look at that so the curriculum therefore is focused on student experience and taking social action on real issues such as violence hunger inequality and others and students are taught how to deal and ultimately fix these issues and what better way do this than doing research that is the reason why you regardless of the curriculum or the program you are enrolled you guys are expected to undergo research at the end of your curriculum all right so that's reconstructionism and the last is constructivism and the person here is john piaget spelling of john is j-e-a-n it's it's kind of uh, sounded like jean but it's actually john piaget is piaget all right so it's a g p-i-a-g-e-t so what about constructivism so here um, the emphasis is on developing personal meaning through hands-on activity activity-based teaching and learning i have already told about this in the previous lecture so learning happens if there is already an interaction between our experiences and the new ideas that we we come to uh, encounter as we are involved in activities so that's constructivism in simplest terms all right so we create meaning out of uh, our previous experience merge with uh, new ideas or new experience for that matter so that's uh, constructivism and those are the six okay philosophies of course divided into two and four respectively for uh, teacher-centered paradigm or approaches and then the learner-centered approaches which has four okay so to yeah here during your insight uh, giving later on you might as well consider uh, answering this question like which teaching philosophy that is learner-centered adherent 
would you want to employ as a future teacher and why okay you may feel free to answer that or still give your personal insights or realizations all right so that's it for the day and i hope to hear from you very soon from your rvls goodbye god bless